that that brings me to the to the next point the point of mm-hmm. um yeah any pitfalls or or challenges you came across when you when you build up this department and this this uh, yeah science or how you want to call it um in sure. my experience uh i had several points that were uh, tricky if you give it to an engineer it won't mm. succeed at all if you okay. uh, don't <laughs> test a lot i mean yes. really make with of us tests really as you said test with people outside your your company um with people that think differently mm-hmm. then it won't succeed do you have any other uh, tips or also pitfalls that yeah that companies should not um yeah <laughs> Should not make. There's a handful. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, and it ranges from what, you know, uh, potential pitfalls when it comes to building the team, the practice itself, as well as potential pitfalls and um, challenges when it comes to producing the experience. Um, I think in the latter, when it comes to producing the experience, one thing that I often notice, particularly from service teams, which I totally get, um, is um, there is a service level agreement around um, escalation. Mm-hmm. So ideally, the whole point of the bot is so that way you don't have to necessarily escalate to a human, that we can take care of it with the mm-hmm. bot itself. Um, but oftentimes, I think that the challenge there is that you potentially trap the user inside of an experience as opposed to giving them a way forward. The whole point of customer service is to try and get a solution. Um, And there are many self-service ways to provide that solution, um, but not providing them a path forward, I think is a major pitfall um, that you could easily fall into. So in order to say, maybe not um, provide an opportunity to escalate to a human uh, so as to not prolong proliferate escalations now all of a sudden the user can't move forward unless you do other things like say uh can you create a case from the chatbot directly can you uh you know access Mm -hmm. information that allows you to access a human potentially in another channel Um, and usually the way i advise teams when it comes to that is hey you know i know you don't want to put transfer to agent in the main menu i get that um but at least at Salesforce, we have it in our um, our acceptable use policy, A, that you cannot pass off the bot to seem human when it's not. You have to say that the bot is a chat bot. And there has to be a way to get to a human eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of the design solution that I came up with for that is rather than, say, putting transfer to agent inside of the main menu, I think of it almost kind of like a video game where it's like, mm-hmm. OK, you're the main character. You're inside of a dark tunnel. And as opposed to seeing, you know, shining a light on the lever to pull the escape hatch, <laughs> we're not going to shine a light on it, but we're not going to get rid of that lever for the escape hatch entirely. Right. Like mm-hmm. there's a difference between the two. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that conversationally, it's OK, we're not going to put it in the main yet menu, mm-hmm. but we will train an intent for it. So that way, if you type to the bot, you know, human, I want to talk to someone, et cetera. Yeah. You're effectively feeling around and finding that escape hatch. We're not necessarily going to show it to you because we don't want to say, hey, just, you know, go here. You, we do want you to try out the bot first, but we're not going to trap you in the experience. Of course, Um, because you then, you, you also gather more information and you also know in the end which use case or which problems uh, are often and which use cases and problems you can solve by by using the bot and which not. Otherwise, right, you exactly. you get the traffic away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then it all kind of um, gets merged together, and it, it's very hard to I think um, disambiguate. Okay, are they escalating? For which reason, um, really, Mm -hmm. like that ends Mm -hmm. up getting lost because we don't really know what the reason is until after they escalate because we've just provided this button that says transfer to agent, Um, you know, and I think that, you know, there's a potential to miss it as well when it comes to um, just typing, uh, you know, free form language because we've trained an intent. Um, But 
without sort of shining a, a light on the escape hatch, I think it allows the user to kind of at least feel around and try to do something before just pulling the mm -hmm. ripcord. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, you know, um, building a team, I think that, again, like, we don't want to overly focus on one discipline over the other. So like if you overly focus on engineering, then without any rigor, when it comes to the language experience whatsoever, mm -hmm. you're not going to succeed yeah. because they're like, unless you have a very design minded engineer who is building the experience, there's not going to be a, um, a pattern when it comes to the interaction design. And so then all of a sudden, when it comes when whether you're uh let's say trying to check your case status or create a case, the the sort of interaction process by which you do both of those things is totally different. Um, that increases the cognitive load for the user and makes it really bewildering in terms of getting mm -hmm. used to how to activate this chatbot. Um I think that. You know, again, if you over rotate in the direction of design, um, at least, you know, when it comes to the sort of language experience, there's a potential of, well, OK, we're going to overly focus on the output, what the bot is going to say to the user, but without necessarily paying enough attention to the input. How is okay. the bot going to understand what the user is saying to it? Mm -hmm. How do we make sense of it? Um, are we going to make it intent enabled or not? Um, those are decisions that need to be made, I think, in a systematic way. And so, um, you know, I think my recommendation there is just, again, to be to be interdisciplinary, but also to be systematic and rigorous, because um, everything we do in conversation does something to the other person uh, in that interaction, whether mm -hmm. that is, you know, uh, informational or transactional, um, it could be confirmational, but it also impacts the relationship between, uh, you know, the people having the conversation. In this case, one of the people is a bot. One of the participants in the conversation is a bot that represents your institution. And so in the same way that you might give your customer service agents, humans, instructions on how to, you know, what is the policy? What is the you know manner in which we approach a customer? What are the things that you say? How does that fit with our brand voice and tone? All of that, you would do that with a human. You need to do that with a bot as well because then it's an extension of your yeah. brand. If for some reason the bot cannot do a certain thing with the user, um, you're going to have to figure out a way to be able to mitigate that in some way conversationally. Otherwise, there is a trust issue that develops between yeah. the user and yeah. the institution, not just the bot. And so I think that, you know, um, big things to think about in particular have to do with, like I said, language variation. You know, not everybody uses the same language in the same way every single time and all it takes is especially when it comes to conversational ai all it takes is one user who's got their finger on the screenshot trigger um to type something or say something to your conversational um system and say sorry i don't understand and say see look this company doesn't care about people like me <laughs> Yeah. Um, and put it all over the internet. And so I think it's very important to make sure, like, how can you explain to the user, no, we've thought about this, and no, maybe we don't support it right now, but, mm -hmm. you know, here's another path forward, or, you know, we're on our way to trying to support this in some way, um, always providing the user a path forward to try and get a solution. So... Just to 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 give an input also also which I, on on my points I experience in this field um mm -hmm. it's as you said in the beginning it's quite similar to design and UX and engineering sometimes yeah. you as a designer you wish to have like a wonderful yacht a wonderful boat and yeah. and you know that this this boat or this yacht won't be feasible from a technical right. perspective be, because it's in my in my in my field i i know what it means behind to build that so it's always this 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 um clinch between um building what you wish to build this yacht and yes. what is feasible in terms of right. budget and resources do you 100%. also experience this 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 yeah 
this poem? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, yeah, I think that that also sort of falls in line with um, sort of like the pitfalls of if you over rotate in the direction of design. Yeah. I think that, and exactly. like desi what designers need to pay attention to themselves, you know, you can, you can paint an incredibly compelling and inspiring <laughs> vision for your stakeholders, but you must always consider, okay, timeline and yeah. infrastructure you know if you can't build this then mm -hmm. what's the mvp what is the minimum viable product that gets you to you know value for mm -hmm. your customers mm -hmm. without um sacrificing too much time right um and so i think that's another thing that you know if um, if you're a designer you have to keep that in mind you know you could go in and say and especially, I think another thing to consider is that for us, particularly as conversation designers, we understand this craft and the technology in a way that many of our stakeholders may not. Um, and that, like, if you're going into your, you know, your uh, meeting with your, say, um, what do you call this, uh, your PM, um, and they're not, uh, you know, they're not totally aware of a particular concept or what have you. Um, it's your job as a designer to get them to understand, help them yeah. understand, okay, why is it that you're doing this in the experience? Same for your engineers. Yeah. Um, or if you don't understand the platform that it is that you're using and the technical constraints, it's also your job to find out what those are and to understand it enough yeah. so that way you can scope your designs. Um, so I think it's an important um, sort of part of the design process for a designer to do that self-reflection and say, okay, what do I know? What do I not know? Don't be afraid to ask the question. Don't be afraid to teach people and have that kind of patience, you know, give some grace to mm -hmm. your partners who don't understand. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, and I think like to not take it personally, it's easy to take things personally when some people say like, okay, we're going to change this about the design. Um, but rather everyone is, everyone is pulling on the product. Yeah. Um, trying to do their best on behalf of the organization for the customer. Um, and sometimes, you know, it, it's not that they want to take the product in a different direction to spite you as a designer, but because there's a constraint that we, yeah, you know, we exactly. can't necessarily get around in order to be able to still go to market in a timely fashion. And so yeah. if that means, hey, we're not going to do NLP, you know, yeah, I mean, as a designer, that sucks, because we know what's possible mm -hmm. if we can do NLP. But at the same time, like if it if it means the difference between delivering the product within, a, you know, uh, what's deemed as an acceptable release time frame for your organization versus not, then well, okay, we want to we want to get something out on the market. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you do your best without the NLP in order to create as strong of an experience as you can, and then revisit it later?